Good morning. This is October 4th, 1999. This is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This morning we have, may I have your name please? Raymond Levitt. Raymond Levitt? Right. Do you mind telling us your age? 77. And your address? Natick. And your current marital status? Married. Do you have children? Two girls. They're both married. And how about grandchildren? Four grandchildren. Four grandchildren. <laughs> uh, where were you born? In uh, Boston. In Boston? I didn't get far. And uh, where, where were you raised, Ray? Uh, mostly uh, Alston, Brighton, and a uh, little New Hampshire for a while. In New Hampshire? Uh, how did you come to come uh, to Natick? Uh, after being, uh, being married, uh, some time we lived in Wellesley for 13 years, and uh, that house was uh, taken over by Wellesley Office Park. Mm -hmm. uh, I had relatives in Natick here, so I liked, liked the town, so we moved out here. About what year was that? Oh, that was about 30 years ago. 1969, something 1960, like that. Uh, 19, well, 1970. Yeah. What was Natick like when you first moved out here? Well, it was a lot smaller town as far as you know mm -hmm. homes go. There's been an awful lot of construction uh, since we've moved here. So you came to Natick after you'd been in the service. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was your family background? But what did your parents do? My father was a butcher. Uh, my mother, uh, she was a housewife. Mm -hmm. I had uh, one older brother who was also in the Navy and a uh, younger sister. Uh, father died when he was about, we about 12 years old there, so we managed without him. <laughs> and uh, let's see, we went to, I went to work uh, uh, for a uh, company in town for about a year or so after I graduated from high school and then I got a call from the Boston Navy Yard. They were looking for people to train as machinists. So I went I went there and uh, after after about a year or so I got a machinist rating and uh, I would have been there all the time but I volunteered for the Navy and <laughs> luckily the, uh, they weren't letting anybody out at that time there, but luckily my car still said helper on it instead of machinist. They never had changed it over. And the officer was in a hurry going out and he looked at the car and he says, oh yeah, we can let him go, he's just a helper. By the time they found out the mistake, it was too late. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to start. Can you tell us the date when you went into the service? Uh, June. June 2nd, I believe it was, in 43. Uh, 1943. Yeah. Okay, and you went in through Boston? That's right. Okay. Um, why did you join the military? Well, I thought it was the thing to do at the time, and uh, all my friends were in. And uh, I feel, felt that I should have won rather than miss out on it. And how old were you at the <coughs> time? Uh, 21. You were 21. And you chose that particular branch, why? Not really, I was going into the Navy itself, but uh, the officer there, he, they, he got me in a room and he told me, he says, the construction materials are looking for men with um, any mechanics experience. And whereas mm -hmm. a machinist, he offered me a third class machinist, right? And if it wasn't that, I would have started off as a, you know, just a uh, lowest grade there. So I say, I might as well take it. There's a lot better money and everything else. Did uh, f family or friends join the service at the same time you did? No, they were various times they was going in. And uh, so you were pretty much all by yourself when you went when into I went Boston. In, yes, my my brother had already gone in, and uh, a few of my other friends. Can you look back uh, quite a way now and remember what it was like going in all by yourself? Well, I didn't mind it because you, you, you meet the different guys there, you start talking and you find they're from, you know, towns right near you and uh, all that. 
So there's no problem. You make your friends in a hurry over there, and I suppose they're feeling the same way. They're looking for friends. Mm -hmm. What did the Navy do with you? Where did they send you for basic training? I was sent to uh, uh, Camp Perry in Virginia. Had you ever been out of Massachusetts before or traveled? Uh, not that much. I've been out of Massachusetts, uh, like I say, New Hampshire and Vermont, and, uh, but most of the time it was all mm -hmm. locally because we didn't have the means of traveling after they. <laughs> That's right. Tell us about Camp Perry. What was it like? Well, they got you there and uh, kept you pretty busy uh, between uh, marching and, and uh, giving us different, uh, oh, what do you call that, uh, indoctrination and uh, speeches on uh, what was expected. Of, and then you do some uh, KP and more marching and double timing. And, they get you up first thing in the morning to be out there for about a half an hour jumping around exercising. <laughs> and uh, there wasn't much time left over for anything else. Um, you, went, you told us that you went down there alone. Did you develop close friendships during basic training? Oh, sure. Meet new guys that you yeah. became close to? There was uh, a lot of guys from Massachusetts went down at the same time. So I mean, in fact, they're one of the guys that worked in the shipyard, and uh, so there was no problem. That's good. Did you receive advanced or specialized training? Uh, not in boot camp, but afterwards in advanced training, I uh, went to Rhode Island and uh, into uh, Camp Holiday in Mississippi, and we had our advanced training there. Uh, I was on become a machine gunner. And uh, then you had your regular training there, you know, hand, hand combat, grenade work, and any of that stuff that goes, you know, with being a trooper. Because they figure you go in with the, the like we, was, we worked out when we went overseas with the 1st Cavalry, so you'd either be with the Marines or the 1st Cavalry or something. You had a lot of uh, Marine, some Marine instructors there. So it was a pretty good thorough uh, training they gave us. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, you went in as a specialized technician, that is, a machinist. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but now you're telling us you also received combat training. Oh yeah, that was that was um, amazing. They didn't didn't have anything to do with the uh, machinist work while we was in going through camp. It was mm -hmm. all training and. Uh, we didn't need any training for our jobs there because the, all the, all the uh, men there were already, you know, pretty proficient in the trades there. So you you were trained on mach in, in machine guns. Yeah, yeah, I was I was a machine gunner there, although I never I never did use them when we got overseas, but it was there in case we needed it. What was they your? Had a, they had a school for it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us what was your specialty? during military duty? Well, actually, uh, we uh, did quite a variety of things. We were building, uh, like we got in the Adelaide's building the airstrip there, and uh, we, I've done uh, demolition work, uh, run bulldozers, and uh, just about Anything that was required, guard duty, you name it. Yeah, construction work. Yeah, in, yeah. Well, most you of were in a construction docks, battalion. Piers, roads. <laughs> you you just jumped to the Admiralty Islands. Um, therefore, you went overseas. Can you tell us about getting overseas? How you got there? Uh, we went over on uh, from Mississippi. We left and we went out on the Zawala Lakes from the Lakes Lines, and uh, went through the Panama Canal and then headed out. Uh, when we hit the Panama Canal, that was where things got a little tougher there. The refrigerators broke down and all the meat started to spoil. <laughs> so they, they were throwing these cow, cow halves overboard and everything else. And we ended up, all we had to eat after that was rice and lima beans. <laughs> and that's where I got to like onions. They had a big pile of onions and bags on the deck. We used to steal them. <laughs> How long did that go on? Oh, about, let's see, I, th I think that was about a month and a half. Took us until we finally hit 
uh, Brisbane, Australia. And uh, of course it didn't change then. We just, they let us go ashore for uh, one night's liberty. And then we was back and we headed out and uh, to Milne Bay in New Guinea. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time we got there, what they say, by the time we got there, I think everybody lost about 20 pounds or more. Yeah, on lima but, uh, beans, I should think so. <laughs> Did well, you go overseas as an individual or part of a unit? Well, I went as part of the unit there. Like I say, the, our, our battalion went over on the ship. Yeah. And uh, after, after we went through the canal, we was, on, we was alone there. And the reason it took so long to get there was they were zigzagging all over the ocean. So for entertainment, like I say, we used to watch the flying fish. <laughs> and uh, at nighttime, it was kind of eerie. You see all these green phosphorus bubbles coming up in there. Wow, you, I used to say, boy, I'd hate like heck to be sunk and have to dive in there. But, uh, and then we hit one bad storm that lasted a few days. There was a lot of seasickness there. The waves were coming over the uh, after the ship, go halfway up the ship, and then they literally were running into it, and it was coming over the bow. <laughs> but uh, like I say, we managed, and then we, we got to uh, New Guinea. My first sight of the jungles, you couldn't see nothing. And uh, we're going in, all I can think of is, if they're gonna drop us off here, yeah, how are they ever gonna find us? <laughs> Well, but when we got there, you could see that they had a setup there. So you're now in New Guinea. Yeah. And you're in a, a, a construction battalion. Yeah. Um, were you in direct combat at? The, uh, Not in New Guinea. No. They had uh, there was more or less getting set up, you know. Tell us what you did at New Guinea. In New Guinea. Yeah. Well, we went out and uh, we did a lot of lumbering, felling trees and all that bringing them in and uh, let's see well, that was about well, most of us get, they need a lumber there they, get, they had a sawmill and they was using I guess uh, sunning up north anyways did your excuse me um, back in training or, or basic training did the army prepare you for what you found way out there in the South Pacific the cultural differences, the weather? Uh, they, they talked to us about it, but it was, you really found out on your own when you mm -hmm. get out there how things were. And, uh, yeah, like one, one thing that happened that I always get a kick out of the first, the first, uh, I think it was the first or second day we were there, they had the tents set up and uh, they were set up in a low area. And well, you get a lot of bad rainstorms as the mountain was there, and the rain clouds were up against the mountain. They couldn't get over, it, and then it would pour like a, you know really come down. And uh, the first or second night there was, we woke up in the morning, and we had about a foot of water. It was just clearing the the uh, bottom of the cots. So it was intense, and uh, everybody's getting up and you know, step up in the water and get dressed. <laughs> And there was two guys, they had set up jungle hammocks outside. They drove three stakes on the ground and swung the hammocks between them. And of course, then they're zipped in with their mosquito netting. And they're sitting there laughing at us, and all at once down come the poles let go, and down come the <laughs> post bunks <laughs> right into the water there. They were struggling to open up the zippers to get out. That'll <laughs> so teach we them had the last laugh. laugh. Yeah. <laughs> The weather was bad, I take it, or at well, least it yeah, rained. Every, you'd, you'd expect a couple of rainstorms every day there, and they know it would come down like a fire hose being turned on you. Were you, the clothing you had, the, the GI issue, was that adequate for well, your, you'd have, where well, you, you were? Well, you didn't need much as far as clothes. It was too hot to, you know, wear someone used to cut off the pants right about here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the sleeves, you'd have cut off the sleeves too. And uh, we had ponchos, that was our mainstay there. Tell us more about the terrain you were in. Had you ever seen anything like that? A jungle, thick? No, and a uh, lot, lot of big uh, bugs there, that was for sure. In fact, the cockroaches, 
<laughs> it was about four inches long and they used to fly. <laughs> so, it's something you don't see around the, the States here. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't fly fast though, they were a slow flying bug. And there was a lot of big snakes there. I mean, we, one of the guys shot, uh, it was an endocondy, he was about 20 somewhat feet long, he was a big baby. And uh, when we was out in the woods, and there was a lot of things that, that happened, like I say, accidents. But uh, well, one case, like when you're cutting down trees here, what you had to be careful of is that all vines going through the top, and you start cutting them, they wouldn't come down after you, they're cut through because the vines would be holding them up, and you may have five or six trees cut, and all at once down they all come at once. So when somebody yelled timber, you better look around. <laughs> I know uh, one kid, his name was Moriarty. He had a two-man saw, which we used. He's walking along with a yellow timber. He looks this way and that way. Down comes a big tree <laughs> and flattened it. But he was lucky. None of the main branches hit him. And uh, he got up and crawled off from underneath it. But the two-man saw went in his arm. He had some real deep gashes there. But uh, they patched them up. What, uh, the, some the, the, the men around you were part of your unit, so you oh, weren't yeah. you weren't in with among a, a bunch of strangers, is that oh, correct? Oh, no, no. Yeah. no what about strange. your leadership, your officers? Do you felt you, you were well-led and uh, good guys at the top? Yeah, they were pretty good guys there. And uh, they seemed to fairly well know what they was doing. It was like I say, they were mostly mechanics, but uh, they, I guess they received training on that end also. You and I talked a minute ago about uh, making friends in the service. Um, you've been in a while now and you're in a unit with people you know. Did you make good friends in the service? Oh yes. And did you stay in touch with them? Stayed in touch with a lot of them for quite a while but because uh, I guess a lot of them come from here in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. at, uh, but then as time went on you get busy, end up getting married and all that, and gradually lose touch with them. While you were in New Guinea, um, how did you hear about what was going on in the rest of the war? Well, you just hear it through uh, Scott Lombard, or you might get letters from home telling you about it. Uh, ships, when they come in, uh, they, they'd be telling you what they saw, where they were, and you get information that way. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you know, get too much. Yeah, I'm assuming this is uh, now somewhere in 1944. 44. Well, 44, we well, we only stayed in New Guinea for about a month and a half. And while I was there, also a, a group of us was sent down to a PT base. They needed some uh, malaria work done. They had a lot of malaria up there. So we went down to the PT base on a PT boat. That was a nice ride. It was probably about 15 miles down the bay there. And uh, all we had to do there was blow a lot of deep ditches in from the ocean and uh, smaller ones going out. And that would let the salt water come in and kill the malaria mosquitoes, you know, as the tides come in and out. Do you remember the name of this base where the PT boats were? Uh, I'm not sure, let's see, it might have been called Canacopi now, I'm not sure of that. Mm -hmm. I can remember a few named Canacopi, Gamadoto, there was a gilly gilly. <laughs> but uh, there was a Lodoba mission, <laughs> but uh, that was way up in the hills, never did get up there. But uh, at the PT base, what was nice is them guys there, they had a kind of a rough uh, life, you know on those small boats, so they used to give them excellent chow. In the mornings when you go for breakfast, they'd ask you, what do you want? they give you what, the eggs any way you want, the fresh eggs and all that stuff. So we were down there for a couple of weeks and it was a couple of good weeks anyways. Then you went back up to your, uh, your own then, station. Yeah, and then we had a, then we were t there was the invasion of the Admiralty Islands, so they sent us in, up, up there. <coughs> we went up on a, uh, a Liberty ship. That was a kind of tough one there. Yeah, everybody was down the holes on <laughs> up 
on bunks, I don't know, high, high, about five or six high. But uh, as the guys told us that when the ships coming down, they said they should go up the coast of New Guinea. There was a Jap base there. And all the ships coming down said they was, you know, going on uh, attacks from the uh, Jap aircraft. So we was expecting that going up. And uh, they asked for volunteers for passing ammunition on the, you know, up at the guns there. So I, I was thinking, oh, I said, well, I'm going to volunteer for that because if you're down on the hold and anything hits, it's going to kill everybody in the hold. So I think up on deck you have a little better chance. <laughs> That's what I thought at the time, anyways. And uh, how did that work out? Well, we had a, a couple of uh, not raised, but they turned out to be just false alarms, there, you know, and get up there and ready to pass the ammo and stuff. And, and they have nothing short of them. They have practice. The guys would be shooting their machine guns, especially out. In, and I used to get a kick out of watching that. You'd, every third bullet was a tracer. It looked like they'd travel way out and then just hang in the sky there after they get so far out. But uh, so anyway, we were lucky we made it up there without running into anything. And uh, we went in on the invasion of the Admiralties at Los Negros. But then again, we got a lucky break. The 104th CB, but not 104th, excuse me, the 40th CB Battalion went in, and they and the uh, first cavalry went in, and they took the uh, Japanese airfield there. So they get into some heavy, heavy fighting there, and uh, I guess the CBs there they they lost about uh, 30 or 40 men there. Uh, we was lucky we came in, we were headed down the other end, and uh, they're going to build a new airfield down there. So, although uh, things seemed to be pretty quiet there, there was uh, an awful lot of dead Japanese laying all around there where they had already uh, had fought it out there. And uh, although when we did pull up, I was on guard, I was, I was in the, on top of a uh, trucking my pal Bill when Mutt was driving it. And of course the roads were nothing but about a foot of mud, if you could call them a road there. There was ruts going through the jungle. You could only travel at a few miles an hour. So on the way down, I know I snuggled down among all the <laughs> equipment because I figured I didn't want to be a sitting duck there. And when we got to our area there, which I say was covered with dead Japs and stuff, as we pulled up, some jab fired at the truck and the bullet went, because there's no, win no windows on the side, bullet went right by my buddy's nose there. And he, he come out with one long leap, he yells, Japs, and he comes out, he lands in the mud and practically disappeared at it, you know. So I hopped on and get behind the wheels looking around where they're coming from. You get a few more shots and the guys all start shooting back like mad, but uh, finally it stopped and the first cavalry, they sent a unit in to the jungle after them. They found one Jap there with a, a, a bullet in an arm and his leg there, so they finished him off, dragged him out, and uh, what few was left there must have taken off. But uh, that was the extent of the big fight. But then, after that, we used to have air raids. The planes that, small amount, maybe two or three planes that come over, but uh, go for the airfields, you know, and, when we had a dry dock out there, they'd go for the dry dock. That continued off and on for maybe a couple of months. You've just described uh, combat with the Japanese. We, did you participate in it? You had well, training as, as a, a, oh, an yeah, infantry. Training, but luckily yeah. we didn't get into any deep fighting, which I was thankful for. I mean, I didn't kill anybody and nobody killed me. That's what counts. But you experienced uh, air raids? Uh, oh, yeah. Night and day, the kind of washing well, machine, nighttime. Charlie kind nighttime of thing. Nighttime, they'd come in, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, all, you know, early in the morning, but, uh, so we, you know, we had a nice big airfield there, but the things you run into a lot was the planes, these bombers, uh, B B-17s, taking off or landing, you know. You On the airstrip somebody. that you made to yeah. help to build. Yeah, the trouble yeah. there was, a lot of them, you know, when they're taken off, they're heavily loaded with bombs. If anything went wrong, like a tire blew or something, they'd crack up and then you'd have some big explosions. Or when they was coming back, a lot of them would be pretty well shot up. And if they was too badly shot up to make a belly landing, why, they'd just 
swing over and the guys would bail out that let it go out to sea. Unless there was wounded on, then they'd have to they'd let the guys bail out, circle around, come back and make a belly landing. Do you know and, where the bombers were going? What targets they were attacking? Oh, islands all out north. I mean, I didn't uh, offhand know ex exactly where. I don't remember now. I did, did you get to know any of the air crews? Uh, yeah, we did. We did. You know, you get talking to them. <coughs> In fact, then, let's see. <laughs> One time, I <laughs> I almost got myself killed. I was <laughs> a plane was going to go up there. And uh, I said, see, he's probably going up to Chesticus in the afternoon, you know. And I said, let's see if I can get a ride with him. I go over and the guys are getting in. And so I'm walking towards it because the props are spinning over. But when they're spinning over the aisle, you can't see them. I was walking right into one. And the last guy getting in, he looks at me and he goes like this. And it dawned me, I was about for me to you away from the prop. And I, oh my God. So I walked around it anyways. And I said, you're going on for a test run, I'd like to come with you. He said, no, we're going on a mission, but if you want to come with us, you can. <laughs> I said, forget it. I said, hoping it happens, they'll never know where I am. <laughs> yeah. They'll think I deserted. <laughs> At where you were stationed, um, did anybody ever come by, by way of USO shows, or did you get any kind of entertainment? Oh, yeah, yeah. Come to the troops? Bob Hope was Tell there. Tell us, Bob Hope? And he put on a nice big show, yeah. A very good show. Who and was in the show, do you remember? Oh. Yeah, them, oh, I can't think of their names now. These girls who used to be in his act all the time. Jerry Colonna? Oh, Jerry Colonna was yeah. there. And, uh, I can't remember the, women, the actresses' names that was there, but... Uh, Tell us about the food you had on this island covered with snakes and <laughs> terrible things. Were you fed well? Uh, no, well, it was just common, common GI food. Like you say, if you was in a place where you couldn't get it, like uh, when on, on ship you'd be salmon sea raisins or K mm -hmm. raisins, you know, and when you come in, like I say, when we come into the islands, at first it was all, you just have sea rations. And finally, when they got a camp set up there, they'd have hot sea rations. <laughs> but uh, you just go along and just slop it in your pan, you know. But then afterwards, you'd have three buckets of boiling water. The first one would be soapy. You swish around your canteen, and then you go to the next one and the last one. But the only trouble is after, about a thousand guys went through, you know, or even a few hundred. All, all the water would get kind of crummy, and <laughs> next thing you know, everybody was having <laughs> dysentery from because the dishes wouldn't be clean enough. I asked you something like this just a minute ago, but um, you're in New Guinea. Did you have any idea of the larger view of where you were going next or what was going to happen to you? No idea. You worked on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, That's right. Because, I mean, uh, nobody would give out that information. And, uh, because the, 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 uh, I don't think even the commander knew until they'd get the uh, mm -hmm. notes. And in fact, when we were going to uh, the Admiralties, we didn't know where we were going until the day we got there. And then the, the skipper come out and told us. And uh, all set to go. And he's, it just, we see all this uh, still bombarding going on there, you know, and ships firing at it. And uh, what are you going to see is jungle there. You were and, a, a young man from Natick, Massachusetts. Um, did you have any idea where the Admiralty Islands were or where New never Guinea heard of was? Them. Never heard of them. I mean, even after you got there, did you know where you were in relationship to anything else, how far you were from Japan? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we uh, saw, looked at maps there and uh, figured out basically where we were from uh, there to Australia and, and uh, the various mm -hmm. places. Like I say, of course, looking on a map, you can't, you know, you're just guessing at the distances. At this point, uh, I've kind of lost track of, of time here. Can you tell us approximately the year and the, the month that you're talking about in New Guinea? Well, New Guinea, that would be, uh, 
that would be, let's see, I'd say about January. Yeah, because we went through the Panama Canal on Christmas. And uh, so we got there about, oh, January, about uh, sometime in the middle of February it was we got there. Of what year now? And that was 1943. Uh, Oh, 44, excuse me. 44, 44, okay. Yeah, and we stayed there. We only stayed in uh, there for about, couldn't have been over six weeks. And that was more or less a preparation place, you know, getting set up. And, uh, and from there they sent us, <coughs> like I said, to the Admiralties and went in there. And uh, we, was, we was in there for some while about a year, and uh, the, the Alfred, they, the Alfreds, they broke it up because they had too many uh, machinists and uh, not enough others, so they, when they, they went up north to the Philippines and they transferred a group of us machinists over to this new Alfred that came in over on Manus Island. So uh, things was a little better then, but even then it's surprising. Uh, we was there for a while. We get this, uh, I, guess, I guess the intelligence got the word down to us that the Japs were going to pull an invasion, a hit and run more or less. So they issued us kind of guns again, set up a firing range, get some practice in. And we had to keep our guns with us for about, I think, two or three weeks there and finally things quieted down. So they took them away and stored them again. But uh, then I guess after that, we, we we ended up staying there for the rest of the war, which was a lucky thing. Now tell us exactly where you were till the end of the war. Manus Island, yeah. Manus? Yeah, that was in the, in the Adelaide, that was the big island. And ex except, for, uh, like I say, going to Australia, Sydney, Australia for a 10 day leave. Okay, that that's good. I'm glad you got out of there for 10 yeah. days. Oh, yeah. Well, as I like, say, when we go, as they told us, you know, in six months, you'll go on a leave or come home, and after another six months, you'll definitely come home. So, like I said, it was about a year and a half they finally sent us on a uh, over to uh, Sydney, Australia, which is a very nice place. We had a nice time there. So, from your perspective, uh, you saw the war going north and the uh, Okinawa, the yeah. last great land battle. Um, so I think, you know, what good? What news were you hearing about it? Mostly radio, I assume. Well, the news you're hearing, like they say, is they're getting closer, and we figured, like I say, they was they were holding back a lot for the for the final invasion. You mm -hmm. know, that's what we figured. But then, luckily, the A bomb come along, and that put a stop to everything. Otherwise, there would have been a lot of the guys there going, you know, for Japan. Can you remember where exactly where you were when you heard about the atomic bomb and the end of the war? Uh, yeah, well, we was on Manus Island, as they say, and uh, the word got to us, I forget just how, uh, that, uh, you know, they had used the atomic bomb, well, they used two atomic bombs on Japan, and Japan surrendered. And uh, then I, even after that, it took us a couple of months to get out of there. They was gonna ship us out right away. Then as the ships come up, then they kept sending them north to bring the guys, because there was a lot of you know uh, guys that had been injured there, so they wanted to get them home first. So it took a couple of more months before we got home. Although there, there was uh, one group they sent ahead of us, and they put them on a Liberty ship. And <laughs> at first I was saying, gee, we missed out on that one. But but luckily, because that Liberty ship took, must have taken them a couple of months. They went all around and came up to Boston. They was at sea an awful long time. And a few weeks later, this uh, brand new LCV, which they had only made six of them, it was a beautiful big ship there, landing sh uh, craft of vehicles. And they fed us good and everything else. And it took us, I think it was nine days to get to the West Coast. <laughs> and. Even after we were there a couple of weeks or so, and we got a train across country, when I was up to the Fargo building, I run up to some of the guys there, and they said, they just got in. 
<laughs> nice this day. Because <laughs> they had nothing to eat but, but uh, rations all the time. And I said, well, a funny, a good thing happened. You had a lot of time at sea, uh, even the shorter trip coming home, and a lot of time to think about what had happened to you since you left Natick and Boston. Can you tell us now what you think your was most memorable experience in your whole military career? One thing that stands out above all others? Well, the one thing that stands out is uh, one day when we're sitting at the uh, at our Quonset hut at noontime and looking over the bay with all the ships out there. And I almost there was a terrific explosion on a ship there. It was the Mount Hood. It was an ammunition ship and they had been unloading it for a while. It was about three quarters unloaded. But still when that ex explosion went off, a cloud of smoke went up about a mile high. And we said it looked like a big sun formed at the top and when that went out the smoke just covered the whole bay for about maybe five minutes or so and the smoke cleared that ship was gone a couple of other ships gone and there was three landing craft heading in shore they beached, beached themselves with big holes in them so uh, like you say the Mount Hood just disappeared uh, they, they never did we never did find out what caused the explosion but of course, something like that you probably wouldn't. I don't know whether it was, I don't think it was enemy action. I think it might have been some explosive going off accidentally aboard the ship. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was uh, about 500 guys died on those, that ship and these other ships that went down. And um, about the same amount, you know, injured. It was, uh, and, was uh, it anybody you knew? No, I didn't know any of those guys on there. But the, all day the, uh, the boat crews with the small boats there, they was out there picking up, you know, the wounded and the dead and the ones that was in the water. But uh, it was quite a scene there. Hmm. Can you tell me, um, looking back, was there a most memorable character, somebody you think of that uh, was funny or sad or some person that you could single out? <laughs> this guy, uh, Blackie uh, Davis there, he was an old miner there from uh, down south there, and he loved to, he loved to collect uh, any munitions and grenades and anything he could find them out. And uh, one base he had a bunch of chap grenades and stuff and fooling around with them trying to take them apart. And, uh, so then, then when he get he get tired of fooling around, he'd throw him away, you know. And like he, he had thrown one grenade into a barrel. A lot of these barrels used to catch on fire from guys throwing butts at them, whatnot, you know, the trash barrels. And uh, this one day I was coming up through the camp, heading for sick bay <laughs> to get a little fungus painter that was on my feet. And uh, I was probably about, you know, 30 feet away from this uh, hut with a barrel outside that was on fire and almost it exploded and all I see is whoosh, all kinds of stuff went by me. Luckily nothing hit me and, except it knocked me back a few feet, you know. And I, what the heck was that? And then this other kid was in the, in the uh, tent there, which was nothing but shreds by then. He comes staggering out holding his head where he had a bad gash, so I took him over sick bay with me. As I found out later on, it was Blackie. He had tossed this. He told me, yeah, he says, don't tell nobody. He said, I know it was a mortar shell. He said, he tossed in there. And I said, boy, it's a good thing it was in the barrel. It would have killed us all. That, took, that barrel took all the concussion up. And, and it looked like, a, like I say, it was full of holes. Another time, he had thrown about 500 rounds of ammunition in a barrel outside our hut. Thank God it was sitting down low in the hut where it was up. You know, it was down in the valley. And, our hut was setting up a ways, and all that ammunition started going off. Somebody set it on fire accidentally with a butt thrown out, and <laughs> I just stayed right in the sack. I could figure it was lower than I was. That was going on for about a half an hour. But, uh, 
Like I said, lucky nobody get the, nobody get hurt from it. Yeah, that would be a bad way to go. Like I said, the barrel again took care of most of the you yeah. know bullets. When and where uh, were you discharged, Ray? Where was I? Yeah, when and where? Oh, it's in the Fargo building in Boston, uh, New Year's Day, 1945. And from there, went out and celebrated New Year. <laughs> yeah, I bet you did. Um, did you join the reserve after you came home, Naval Reserve, anything uh, like that? No. I was going to join, and me and a buddy of mine that worked there, we talked it all, and, we, and uh, this was some while afterwards, and uh, we get talking about it. We said, okay, Monday, Monday we'll go in and join the reserves. So over the weekend, the uh, Korean uh, War broke out in uh, uh, Vietnam. I came on Monday, I said, you still want to join? He says, the hell with that. <laughs> changed their mind. So that changed yeah, our mind yeah. right there. Did you join any uh, veterans organizations, American Legion or something like that after no, you got No, I, I never got involved with it. Back to the time I see if I can see it. And there's a lot of, well, cause I know they do a lot of good things, but you go up there and it seems all the guys are hanging around playing cards, drinking and smoking. And, I wasn't a drinker or a smoker, so I said, no, I don't think I'll get involved. Although, I like they say, I know they do a lot of good, but uh, to hang around at the meetings, it wasn't my bag of tricks no more. What were your feelings about coming home? This is January of 45. Yeah. The war wasn't over yet. No, it was uh, over. The war got over in uh, about October, isn't it? Or September of 45. September, October, there were bullets. I know, because I was stuck overseas a couple of months after I got over. Okay, then I'm mixed up on my dates, but um, what were your feelings about coming back east and back to where you had left from? Well, after, after all the disappointments of trying to get home, they'd bring up a ship and they'd cancel it and stuff. I says, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say I'm home till I step off the ship in Frisco. <laughs> So, get off there, it was fine, we knew we was there then. And uh, I was glad to be home, and when I get, got back to my family, glad to see him and my old buddies. And, mm -hmm. Some of them didn't make it back, but uh, most of them did. What were your feelings, so what were the feelings of uh, your family or the town of Natick about uh, a veteran coming home? Did you feel welcome? Oh, yes, yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. Everybody was glad to see you, and when we were going to a movie, we still had the uniforms on. They'd tell you, come right in, you know, <laughs> no charge. And uh, so I think I say, every place seemed to, you know, walk on the veterans. How important to you was serving in the military? Well, it was very important. Uh, I'm glad I did it, and I'll never regret it, but I wouldn't want to go through it again. How did it affect the rest of your life? Well, after that, I went back to work at the shipyard, so I, at least I was guaranteed my job back there. And luckily, I managed to stay there. I worked there until they closed in, uh, what was it, 73. By then, I could get, my, I could get an early pension because I had enough time. I had 30, uh, 33 years in out in service time. And uh, after that, like I say, also, while I was in, a couple of hospitalizations, government, you know, took care of that, went into uh, federal hospitals. And uh, when I bought my house, I went through the GI Bill. You've just uh, answered a question I haven't asked yet. <laughs> It's taking advantage of some of the benefits that derive from the military. Uh, you did you you got hospitalization? Did you use the GI Bill or insurance or something like that? No, I used uh, what for hospitalization. No, I just uh, like I say. Well, I I don't want to work over the ship a lot of us. We used to go over the soldiers' home, mm -hmm. and uh, before the, before that, I mean. When I first got out of the service, I, I went up to the Brighton Marine Hospital for uh, an operation there. Pretty good, you know, it covered us for everything back then. 
Okay. You, you, when you came home, the uh, welcome in the town, free movies, that I mean, they were men that did the same thing I did, and uh, whatever their country told them to do, they had no control over whether they was doing right or wrong. As far as they was concerned, they was doing the right thing, and I think they were. Maybe uh, if, if it didn't turn out that way, uh, you shouldn't hold it against them. This business, I mean, they could call them baby killers and stuff now. Some of those things might have happened, but it would be very few, you know, the guys that would have done anything like that if they did. So I think the guys deserve a lot of credit. That was some pretty tough uh, living out in them jungles. That's probably worse than what we had. Is there anything I haven't asked you that uh, when you prepared to come in today, you thought, gosh, I'm going to be sure to say this. Is there anything else you'd like to add that I haven't thought of? Uh, oh, the one other, one other thing was, uh, like you say, they, they tell you sometimes what good uh, treatment the guys get in these ships and, uh, and uh, trains and whatnot. But uh, like I say, I know we was uh, going by train he said it was like cattle cars there. <laughs> and uh, they had the guys all jammed up for to a seat. <laughs> and uh, going down to even, like you say, from here to, to uh, Mississippi, it took four days to get down there. And you know, no, no place to sleep or nothing. We used to take two seats and put them together and sleep on our sides. Four people across two bunks, you know. But like I said, it didn't last too long. Oh, when we was. We went to uh, Sydney, Australia. They were flying on them for a while, but then they, they figured they couldn't get enough men flown down there to all get their leave, so they decided to send the last 200 down all together. So they put us on this uh, landing craft for infantry. That's a flat bottom, small barge, you know. And uh, we went down that way there. and. They had these canvas bunks, just uh, five high on the side of the boat, you know, held up by chains. <laughs> and it was a flat bottom boat, and you hit those waves, you come down, it would spank there, those bunks would jump in. <laughs> you had to sleep curled up with a knot there to keep them flying out of the bunks. And of course, then they had no water for washing up, just for drinking. You couldn't shave. We looked like a bunch of bums there, but you know, 10 days later, we. <laughs> nine days, I think, to hit uh, Australia. That's the first we had to we get up there, run into a barber shop, <laughs> get a shave, they get a room and get a bath there. Because like I said, there was no, no bathing on there or anything. So about 10 days on the ship seems like, seemed like a long time. I'll tell you, I was swallowed, but there was one time a submarine come up near it. All the guys started to run to one side, and you could see that ship going, and the skipper came out, and he was crying out loud, get back to the other side, you're rolling us over. <laughs> and it was, it was one of our subs anyway, so the guys get back. That's good luck. Yeah. Well, he figured if it was a sub, they couldn't torpedo you. The shallow, flat bottom, the torpedoes would go right underneath you. I don't think they'd waste one on a small ship anyway. But, uh, I guess I, I, I've, Except, except for that ship coming back home, I never was on a comfortable one. On the one that was a likes, that had five bunks high there, and you'd wake up in the morning, and you'd have hundreds of guys there all breathing in the same air, you know? And you wake up with a big head, <laughs> just from breathing in the carbon monoxide. And uh, you couldn't wait to get up on deck. But, uh, you say, that was, that was just an experience. You go through it once, you wouldn't do it again, though. Yeah. Ray, a long time from now, people are going to look at this tape uh, to hear about your experiences. Is there any one overriding thing that you'd like to say to the people in the future that are looking at this about your experiences in the military? Uh, about was, 
All I can say about war is it's a war is a useless thing, and uh, people when they go into war, all they do is lose the cream of the crop. The young men, they lose a bunch of innocent civilians in these countries, and it uh, doesn't do a thing. Afterwards, we end up being their friends, <laughs> and uh, so the best thing is until they can find some other way to settle their differences. There, we're, we're in a lot of trouble. Okay, we want to thank you very much for coming in today. Um, it's a very historic thing that is of value to uh, the country, and we appreciate you coming here. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Glad to have been here.